Hey, everybody, I am live. I can't believe it. Me and technology just don't ever seem to work out. So, But here I am. I'm live. I said I was going to tell a story about this sword. So waiting for a few people to join. I love collecting swords. Uh, years ago, we were in, the, in Spain and with the WWE, and uh, had, I got incredible heat that tour. I mean, JBL was on fire at the time, all kinds of heat, still had the rivalry with Eddie Guerrero. In fact, the one uh, Plaza del Toros, I believe it was, they used to have that down in Monterey, Mexico, where he used to wrestle for CMLL and Mr. Elizondo. For I met the Vampiro uh, Canadiens. I was a Vampiro Americano, which is a separate story, which I might tell in just a second. But I was going to get a bullfight practice uh, little thing. Like it's for kids. I was going to take it to the ring. And they were seriously about to call the police on me. They, they were tired of me getting heat. So I go from uh, after the tour, I go from Spain and take the ferry over to Morocco to Tangier because I wanted to go to North Africa and just see Morocco. So I get there and I see the snake charmer. There wasn't much tourist season at the time. I think it was winter. So not many people were around. But I found this sword, this camel sheath sword from the snake charmer, and I bought it for $100. And I said, can I carry this back into uh, Spain? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. I sold six yesterday, which there weren't six people there. I saw tourists. I should have known better. So I buy the sword for $100, this sword. I get on the ferry. Now, you have to go through customs because you're going from North Africa to the EU in Spain. So as I walk through customs, I start thinking, something is not right here. There's a conveyor belt. <laughs> there's a metal detector. I put a sword on the conveyor belt. It walked, went right through. Two guys were sitting there talking, didn't even look. The thing beeped, didn't say a word. I thought, well, maybe the sword is okay. So I got the sword, carried the sword on the ferry going into uh, Spain, Algeciras, I think it was. Get into Spain. And I'm thinking, this is really a bad idea. I'm going to put this sword and go through customs with a sword. Now, this is after 9-11. Put the sword down on the uh, x-ray detector. Walk through. Nobody says a thing. Grab the sword, walk out, and I get arrested by the Spanish police. They are about to throw me in jail for this sword. It's like I've snuck dirty uranium into the country, and I'm about to get a weapons charge after 9-11. So there's an officer there, and I grew up in Texas, uh, but I, I don't speak that much Spanish. I speak just a little, but I couldn't understand him because he was speaking so fast. And he started writing and just kept writing. He wrote at one point an entire page of my arrest record. They're arresting me, about to throw me in a Spanish jail. And I'm sitting there trying to tell him that I bought the sword from some snake charmer. He doesn't understand my English. And I'm trying to explain to him that I, I didn't mean to bring a weapon in. So finally, the guy gets down to the very end. and I realize I'm going to jail now. I give him my wallet. I try to bribe him. At that point, my wife walks in and says, what in the world's going on? And I said, well, I'm getting arrested for that sword. She said, I told you not to buy that. She said, now's not the time to tell me you told me so. So anyway, as I'm sitting there waiting to get cuffed and stuffed, a guy walks by outside the window and he stops. And he looks back in and I can tell he recognizes me. Now, remember, JBL had a lot of heat at that time. And this guy's obviously a wrestling fan. So I motioned for him and he comes in and he could tell he's just eyeballing me. And you could tell he's a fan because he doesn't like me. And so I say, hey, you know The Rock? And he says, yeah. I said, that's a friend of mine. I said, yeah, really? I said, we're good friends. I said, Stone Cold? I said, it's a friend of mine. I said, Undertaker, I'm just killing kayfabe. I said, yeah, yeah, he's a buddy of mine. We don't really don't dislike each other. Eddie Guerrero, good friends. We're really good friends. And so finally the guy starts talking to me. He goes, what are you being arrested for? And I said, well, I got this sword. And he said, you can't bring a sword into Spain. It's highly illegal. And I said, well, no kidding. I It's highly illegal. I said, but what do I do? I didn't mean to. I just bought the sword for 100 bucks. It's a souvenir sword. I'm not going to go swing it around storming a castle or something. And he said, okay. So he talked to the guy. They talked back and forth really fast in Spanish. I couldn't understand him. The guy looks up at me, sighs, wads up the arrest record, throws it in the trash, and hands me the sword back. I said, I don't want it. <laughs> the thing almost got me arrested. He goes, no, no, no. Take it, take it. He goes, mistake. So I took the sword and walked out of the police station with the sword. 
I stopped at one of the first hotels I could find, walked to the concierge, handed him this sword. They looked at me in, in shock. And I said, I don't care what you do with it. Please mail it to me, but you can mail it to the moon. Just get it out of my hands. And by the time I got back, there was my sword. So when I get back, I'm telling the boys about it. And I'm the, the guys are sitting around listening. Can't believe I almost went to jail in Spain. And Mick Foley says, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, Mick, just a minute. Said, and so I'm telling the story. Finally, Mick changes his seat and sits right by me on the plane. He said, how do you, how do, you do a commentary? How do you do events? I said, Mick, I just almost got arrested. I have no idea what you're talking about. A couple weeks later, separate issue, Mick uh, decided he's had enough. Doesn't want to do commentary. So that is uh, the sword, and that is the sword. That I bought. So uh, let me see uh, if we got any questions out there. You and Michael Cole ever do a podcast together? I love I loved it my, with Michael Cole. You know, people always ask me the greatest play-by-play -play guy. I really didn't get to work with JR. Uh, so no disrespect to JR. You know, I, I guess you'd probably consider JR the greatest of all time. He was in the greatest era, I think, with the Attitude Era. Michael Cole, to me, was just head and shoulders better than anybody I ever worked with. And remember, I didn't work with JR, so no disrespect. But I'd love to do something with uh, Michael Cole. Um I'd love to tell your wife's giving you a lecture in the middle of an arrest. Yes, thank you very much. I, <laughs> I did too. Hey, I got uh, some questions here from Sebastian Williams off of Twitter. Thank you for sending me these. I appreciate it. I have a lot of fun with these. I hope you do too uh, out there. Mount Rushmore of wrestling. Now, this one's good because uh, the first three to me are easy. I think you got to go Stone Cold. I think you got to go Bruno. Sold out the guard 187 times. They may count the Hall of Fame too. Bruno, I mean, you got to go with Bruno. And Hulk Hogan started WrestleMania. And I think the, the fourth person to me is hard. Uh, do you go with Flair? Uh, obvious choice. But do you go with Shawn Michaels? Obvious choice. Undertaker? The Rock? I mean, to me, it's tough. The fourth one is tough. The top three, I don't think are as tough. And Flair may go in the top three. I, I don't know. You know, it's hard, the nature boy, to, where to put him. But I think Bruno... Uh, and it's tough. Bruno, Stone Cold, and uh, Hulk Hogan. Uh, top three. Then probably Flair, I guess, would be the fourth. Hey, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. we got all these stuff Briscoe and I are doing. And as we're doing it, I'm putting in the playlist all the matches that we talk about. So we talk about Stan Hansen, and uh, we got uh, Medusa coming on this week. We had the Freebird reunion last week. Got all their matches in the playlist where you can go through and watch them. Tell you a funny one about Stan Hansen. I love Stan, by the way. He's one of my idols. Man, good guy. Stan was going to climb to the top rope. He was going to drop a knee on somebody in the ring. He dropped it right on it. So the guy said afterwards, he goes, Stan, what happened? Stan said, well, I got up there and realized I didn't know what I was doing. And I thought, I was either going to hurt myself or hurt you. You saw what I chose. <laughs> Everybody just laughed because that was Stan. Uh, let's see here. Uh, go to the questions here. Uh, Michelle Falconer. Ask me, do you like being a heel or a baby face? I was a terrible baby face. You know, it's hard when you're big to be a baby face because people got to get sympathy on you. That's why Magnum TA, who we had on, uh, I think, last week with stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw, uh, if you want to look at the episode, it was one of the greatest baby faces of all time. A big guy. That's really tough. Tough for Undertaker. Tough for big guys to be baby faces. And I just wasn't very good at it. I was more naturally a heel. <laughs> I know you can't find that hard to believe. Ian James asked me, how'd you hook up with Otto Vance? And uh, I was, this is a great story. Otto Vance, Larry Cameron died in the ring in Bremen, Germany. Larry Cameron was an American wrestler. It seems like there's some suspicious things around it. The entire American crew wouldn't go back to Europe to work for Otto Vance and Peter Villiam. So they hired an entire new American crew. That's how I got my job there. I worked there for two years for Otto and, and Peter. We worked in Vienna and Graz and then worked Hanover and Bremen were our main towns. Hanover, we worked eight straight weeks every single night uh, in the same building from the same people. And Otto was going, had the last one slot left. I would sent pictures. I would sent videos. I was trying to get a job. And Otto uh, was sitting there with Jimmy Suzuki, the Japanese reporter, good friend. And he says, oh, I know Johnny Hawk. He said, he's a good boy. Otto goes, okay, I take it. And that's how I got a job. <laughs> Not because of merit, but because Jimmy Snuka uh, was there. Uh, let's see, any more questions? 
Can you close on me from hell? Yes, I, I, I'd be happy to. Uh, Tim Taylor asked me about the pyro in 2007. 2007, I came out and just did the pyro and, and all of the stuff. Uh, that was Vince's idea, 100%. And you just, you've just you seen him kind of do something similar uh, with Jericho later. Uh, you know, it's, there's only so much you can do in wrestling. You know, a lot of things get recycled. So I'm sure it had been done before, and I'm sure it will be done again. Uh, it certainly uh, worked. Uh, Greg Prescott asked me about uh, heel Briscoe. He thought Briscoe would be on the show. Briscoe's a heel no matter what you talk about. So <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, so let's see. A couple other questions. Oh, Improvise. Pete Cat from uh, Twitter asked me about this. I tell you something. He asked me if I did something that I improvised. We used to improvise all the time. One thing that I really regret not improvising, I was in Portugal one time. And man, when JBL was really rolling, it had a lot of heat, especially overseas. And this is crazy. I got this from Iron Sheik. I got up there one day and I told uh, the crowd, now don't boo me. I'm going to sing the national anthem. Or I'm going to say, God bless America. I, I thought people would just sit there and watch. They got furious. They're throwing stuff. Then I decided as a rib on Tony Chimmel, the ring announcer, that I would have him carry the American flag and I would sing God Bless America. Well, they want to throw stuff at the American flag, so they would just bomb Chimmel with Cokes and beer and everything else. He used to hate it. So I'd sit up there and sing God Bless America over and over. This, this is the old Iron Cheek gimmick, and it got tons of heat. The whole crowd in Portugal that day, in Lisbon, Portugal, drowned me out. They're singing some national It was awesome. They're singing some national song. As soon as they got done, they sang another one. It goes on for probably 12, 15 minutes. Uh, just singing. It was insane. Bob Holly comes to ring. I'm wrestling Bob. And I go over. And I, at, as soon as I did, I thought, man, that was a house show. I should have just gave the people what they wanted and changed the finish. And, and I, I regret that because that place would have gone banana. Uh, banana, as Pat uh, Patterson would say. When somebody says, we'd like to be a manager of a current superstar. Yeah, I'd love to. Of course I would. It'd be a lot of fun. Uh, I've, I've, I've actually... Uh, Told him I was would be interested. Ever thought about having a political career? I live in D.C. and <laughs> these guys are awful, man. <laughs> Not sure I want to be. Somebody asked me about charities, and again, uh, I've worked with a lot of charities around the world. We work with poverty using sport to help kids. I'm coming out with a new podcast that will be on this YouTube channel. People changing the world. There's some really cool stuff going on with sport in different places around the world. Uh, Memphis Center City Rugby, I'm on the board there. Shane Young, uh, Devin O'Brien, they've done incredible work in some of the uh, worst child poverty in the USA, helping kids get educated, get jobs. He's going to be the first on my podcast, uh, People Changing the World. But I'm going to interview guys from all over the world. I've been to Malawi, Rwanda, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, worked in the slums of India uh, and uh, the gangs of uh, – Chicago, there's a great program there. Rob Costanetto, Beyond the Ball, works with right between the Latin Kings and Two Six Nation. I'd love to have Rob on the show. But that's uh, what I really want to do. There's so much bad news out there. I want to do something positive. Somebody said, check out Australian Rules Football. Uh, I would love to. Actually, I, I do like Australian Rules Football. I've watched it quite a bit. Uh, a couple more questions. I don't want to you – know, thank you guys for, for joining me. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, if you would. <laughs> if you don't, that's okay. <laughs> uh, so let me see. A couple more questions. Uh, thoughts on working with Batista? I like Batista. I love Dave. Dave. Dave and I did not have great chemistry in the ring together, and it just happened sometimes. We both tried, it, and we just didn't have good chemistry. Outside the ring, we did. We, Dave and I were good friends. I assume we're still good friends. He's done a wonderful job in acting. Uh, very happy uh, for Dave. Going to the Hall of Fame, same as I am this year. Um, let's see. Going to the Hall of Fame. Yes, I'm going to the Hall of Fame this year. A dream match I never had. I thought about this because I saw the podcast with Randy Orton and Stone Cold. Uh, Magnum T.A., no doubt about it. That, that's the one match I would love to have had because he was such a freaking hot baby face. And, man, the, the the money that he and JBL could have drawn together, I think, would have been uh, amazing. Uh, 
beat the big show in a bar bar steel cage match. Uh, that was, uh, I believe that was my idea uh, to, to go through the cage and actually come out underneath and beat the big show. I had to figure out a way to, to beat the big guy without hurting him, obviously. And you had to keep JBL alive. So that's always tough when the heel has such a long run uh, because you tend to lose heat and you tend to become a baby face because the longer you are, it's like any bad guy in a movie or anything. You're a bad guy long enough. Uh, people start to like you. So uh, one more question. And let's see here. The new blackjacks. Uh, yeah. Thank you for asking. Barry Wyndham was awesome. Uh, he was highly underrated. He was cool. Hand Luke. He used to drive a car faster. Than any human being I've ever seen for longer drink more beer. Barry was just uh, a guy's guy, <laughs> a really good guy. And Barry could still go at the time he was with us. They just didn't have, you know, hate to blame stuff on creative, but they didn't have anything for us. They didn't see the Black Jacks going anywhere. And that's a shame because Barry uh, could still go. He, if he hadn't got hurt, he would have been a world champion for a long time. Uh, he blew out his knee and right when he's getting to the uh, top of his prime. And finally, greetings from Ireland. Um, I've had a great time in Ireland from what I've been told, <laughs> as they say. Oh, I had some fun in Dublin. Uh, I had some fun in Belfast, too. I know that's different North Island. They don't get on me, but I had so much fun in, in Ireland. Just good people. Uh, a, lo a lot of fun over there. Uh, so, guys, uh, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate it. Uh, send me some more questions, like my YouTube channel, all that different stuff. I'll answer all of it. Uh, having a fun time uh, interacting. I didn't do that for so long because I was always a heel. And back in the day, heels were heels 24-7. So I would turn people down from autographs, from pictures, for everything, because that was the character. You didn't want people to like it. You know, you didn't – not that we were trying to fool people into showing that the business was a shoot as compared to it was a work. It just didn't want to insult them. You know, I don't want to go to a Broadway theater and see the Phantom of the Opera as a waiter at Del Frisco. You know, I just – I want to believe for a while. And that's what I thought people did, too. And that's one of the reasons I always stayed in, in character so long. So I've enjoyed always getting around and answering uh, the questions. So, guys, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate it. You guys all have a great day. And uh, hopefully I got your questions answered. And if I didn't, send me uh, something by Twitter, by Facebook, and I will. Have a great day.